City, A Story of Roman Planning and Construction by David McCauley. This book is copyrighted and is for classroom use only. By 200 BC, soldiers of the Roman Republic had conquered all of Italy except the Alps. In the following 300 years, they created an empire extending from Spain to the Persian Gulf. To ensure their hold over these lands, the Roman soldiers built permanent military camps. As the need for military force lessened, many camps became important cities of the Roman Empire. The Romans knew that well-planned cities did more to maintain peace and security than twice the number of military camps. They also knew what a city was more than just a business, government, or religious center. It was all three, but most important, it had to be a place where people wanted to live. Because cities were built either where no city previously existed or where a small village stood, the maximum population and size were determined before construction began. The planners then allotted adequate space for houses, shops, squares, and temples. They decided how much water would be needed and the number and size of streets, sidewalks, and sewers. By planning this way, they tried to satisfy the needs of every individual, rich and poor alike. The planners agreed that when a city reached its maximum population, a new city should be built elsewhere. They recognized the dangers of overpopulation. A city forced to grow beyond its walls not only burdened the existing water, sewage, and traffic systems, but eventually destroyed the farmland on whose crops the people depended. Although Verbonia is imaginary, its planning and construction are based on those of the hundreds of Roman cities founded between 300 BC and AD 150. No matter what brought about their creation, they were designed and built to serve the needs of all the people who lived within them. This kind of planning is the basis of any truly successful city. The need for today is greater than ever. Page 7. For almost 200 years, the wheat and grapes of northern Italy's fertile Po Valley had been collected in small trading villages and shipped to Rome. In 26 BC, a disastrous spring flood destroyed the villages along the Po River banks, as well as an important bridge. When news reached the Emperor Augustus, he immediately dispatched to the stricken area 45 military engineers, including planners, architects, surveyors, and construction specialists. They were to supervise the building of a new bridge and new roads and to lay plans for a new city. The city was named Verbonia and, in honor of the Emperor, Augustus Verbonia. Augustus hoped to combine all the remaining trading villages into one secure and efficient trading center and so increased the amount of produce coming into Rome. To speed up development of the new city, he retired to the area 2,000 soldiers, who would not only help build Verbonia, but also become its first citizens. Page 8. First, the surveyors selected the place where the city would be built. They chose a flat but sloping site to ensure good drainage that was high enough to avoid future floods. A Roman priest examined the livers of a rabbit and a pheasant from the area to find out if it would be a healthy place in which to live. When the animals were found to be without fault and an investigation of the land turned up no stagnant pools, the gods were thanked and the choice of the site was officially confirmed. The soldiers and the slaves who traveled with them then set up a military camp called a castrum. First they dug a protective ditch and erected a stockade fence around the rectangular area. Next the two main streets were marked off, one running from north to south the other from east to west. They crossed at right angles above a long open space called the Forum, where the soldiers would gather daily to receive their orders. At one end of the Forum, the commander's tent was pitched. The tents for soldiers, slaves, and supplies filled the remainder of the castrum and were grouped in rows. In the following months, all the tents were replaced by permanent wooden shelters, and a temporary bridge was constructed over boats anchored side by side across the river. Page 13. The engineers worked throughout the winter, measuring, designing, and drawing. By the spring of 25 BC, the Roman year 728, the master plan for Verbonia was ready. The center of the castrum became the center of the city. The main street running from north to south was now called the Cardo, the one from east to west, the Decumanus. Both were widened and lengthened, and the rectangular area of the camp was increased to 720 yards long by 620 yards wide. This space allowed a maximum population of approximately 50,000. A greater number, the planners believed, would make the city too large and unable to meet the needs of the people. The entire area was divided by roads into a chessboard pattern. Almost all of the blocks, called insula, were 80 yards square. 
A high wall was designed around the city in which fortified gates were located where the main streets cut through. Around the city, but inside the wall, a 30-foot wide strip of land called the Pomerium was marked off. It represented the sacred boundaries of the city, within which the land was protected by the gods. The city planners indicated those facilities which served all the residents. They designed a new and larger forum which was to become the government and religious center of the city. They located public water fountains, the aqueduct that would bring the water, a central food market, public baths and toilets, and an entertainment center made up of a theater and amphitheater. They also set aside spaces for future buildings. Page 14. No privately owned building, they decreed, could be higher than twice the width of the street on which it stood. This ensured that sunlight always reached the streets. They also required all persons whose buildings faced one of the main streets to build, at their own expense, shelter over the sidewalk for the comfort and protection of all pedestrians. The master plan allowed much freedom for the residents to determine the appearance and character of the city through the buildings they would construct for themselves. Each insula, left deliberately empty on the plan, would eventually be filled with buildings of all sizes and be crossed by narrow back roads and alleys. Some of the insula, designated for private ownership, were divided up among the soldiers, traders, and farmers. The names of the owners and the size of their holdings were inscribed on the plan and set to the land office in Rome. A copy of the plan was carved on marble and stood in the forum for everyone to see. Even though land was given to Verbonius' first settlers, each person had to pay for the construction of his own house. Page 16. In the early summer of 25 BC, a plow drawn by a white cow and a white bull, guided by a Roman priest, cut a furrow around the site. This solemn religious ceremony marked the location of the city wall and ensured further protection by the gods. The plow was lifted only where gates were to be built. Following the ceremony, the surveyors marked off the roads using an instrument called a groma to make certain that all roads intersected at right angles. The groma was a pole about four feet high on top, of which was a cross was laid flat. When weighted strings hanging from each end of the cross hung parallel to the center pole, the groma was known to be perpendicular to the ground. The streets could be accurately marked off by sighting down the intersecting arms of the cross. Page 17. Scene of Groma. The same method was used to mark off roads and farmland outside the city. Page 20. The materials used most in the construction of Verbonia were stone, clay, mortar, and wood. The stone came from a limestone quarry owned by the government. Besides many work sheds, the quarry contained a forge for making and repairing tools and a carpenter shop in which cranes and pulleys were built. The skilled laborers cut, polished, or carved inscriptions in the stone. The unskilled workers separated and lifted the huge blocks from the earth. The stone was usually cut with a saw. When the stone was very hard, the blades used in the saw had no teeth. Sand and steel filings were placed under the blades, and the back-and-forth motion of the saw ground away the stone. When the stone could not be sawed, a row of holes was drilled where it was to be divided. Wooden stakes were then jammed into the holes. When water was poured over the stakes, they swelled, splitting the stone along the line of holes. Page 21, Scene of Stole Quarry Page 21. The clay was made into bricks and tiles in factories near Eretium. The clay, dug out of large pits in the ground, was formed into standard shapes and sizes using wooden molds. The mold was then removed and the wet clay placed in an oven to dry and harden. All bricks and tiles were stamped with the name of the factory owner and the name of the emperor. The mortar used between bricks and stones and in concrete was a mixture of sand, lime, a powder obtained by burning limestone, and water. When mortar was used in construction underwater, a gravelly substance called pozzolana was added which made the mortar extremely hard when it set. The wood used for scaffolding and wood framework came from a forest at the foot of the Apennine Mountains to the north. Before building could begin, laborers had to be found. Besides the soldiers, many poor farmers from the countryside came to work and settle in the city. The majority of workers, however, were slaves, either owned by the state or by the wealthy businessmen, or they were prisoners of war from Gaul, Greece, or Egypt. 
unless they were skilled, the laborers were formed into work gangs to do jobs requiring no particular skill. To maintain as high a level of work as possible, the laborers were treated almost as well as the soldiers. Page 24, a sample of the tools used by Roman craftsmen. Page 25, a great variety of tools was needed throughout the construction of the city. Most were made in forges and workshops on the site. The more precise measuring instruments and squares were brought from Rome. Page 26, Road Construction. Page 27, the new roads and bridge were completed before work began on the city itself. Once the surveyors had marked out a road with stakes, a ditch was dug on each side into which a row of curbstones was set. A deeper ditch was then dug between the two rows of curbstones, which was filled with layers of stone of varying size. The top layer formed the pavement of the road and rose slightly in the center to force the rainwater into the side ditches. The pavement was constructed of flat stones that were carefully fitted together. Any spaces left between them were filled with smaller stones or pieces of scrap iron. Page 28. From the boat bridge, work began on the permanent bridge. It was to be made of wood and supported on five stone towers called piers, which were to stand in the river. Coffer dams were built so the laborers could erect the piers without having to work underwater. First, piles were driven into the riverbed. These were oak tree trunks, with all the bark scraped off, chiseled to a point at the bottom. They were chained together vertically in a shape around which the river could easily flow. When the gaps between the piles had been filled with clay, the water was pumped out of the enclosed area. Each pier stood on a foundation of tar-covered piles and was constructed of carefully cut stones on the outside and smaller uncut stones on the inside. The mortar used between the stones contained pozzolana. When the piers reached a height of 30 feet above the river, wooden arches were hoisted into place between them. Page 29, Roman Bridge Construction. Page 30, a wooden road was nailed to the arches and covered with a layer of earth. The finished road stood almost 60 feet above the river. Page 32, scene of Roman wall construction. Page 33. The city wall was built next. Two large ditches were dug along the furrow, and the dirt was heaped into a high mound between them. A stone wall was built against each side for additional strength. The base of the outer wall went down 30 feet below the ground level, making it almost impossible for anyone to tunnel under. On top of the outer wall, alternating high and low sections called crenellations were built. The soldiers were protected behind the high sections, while firing their weapons over the low sections. The inner wall was several feet higher than the outer wall to block the path of rocks and arrows that might be fired into the city. Cranes on top of the mound lowered the stones into place. Four men standing inside a wooden wheel at the base of the crane provided the power. As they walked toward the wheel, it turned, rotating an axle which wound the rope. The engineers constantly checked to make sure each course of stones was level. Page 34, Scene of Roman Gate Construction. Page 35, Each gate contained three vaulted openings, one for the road and another for each sidewalk. When the walls on both sides of the road were finished, a wooden arch called a centering was supported between them on projecting stones. The masons, working from both sides, then placed wedge-shaped stones on top of the centering. When the keystone was inserted in the center, the arch was complete. The centering was then moved sideways, and another arch was constructed next to the first. This process was repeated until the entire passageway was covered by a semicircular roof called a tunnel vault. The sidewalks were covered in the same way. The openings in the gate were sealed by heavy wooden doors. The central opening was also protected by a wooden gate called a portcullis, lowered from a room above the street. Both the doors and the portcullis were covered with bronze plates. Page 36. Along the wall and on each side of the main gates, high watchtowers were built for additional protection. At first, Verbonia's drinking water came from several deep wells within the city walls, but the planners knew that as the population increased, the wells would no longer be sufficient. 
a pipeline called an aqueduct was proposed to bring water from the mountain lakes 38 miles to the south. When the best route for the aqueduct had been chosen, a profile map of the land was drawn showing the hills and valleys. To determine the profile, surveyors used leveling instruments called corobates. The corobate was shown to be a level when weighted strings fastened to the horizontal bar hung parallel to the legs. This was double checked by pouring water into a groove on top of the horizontal bar. When the distance between the top of the water and the top of the bar was the same all around the groove, the instrument was level. By sighting along the corobate, the surveys, surveyors were able to create an imaginary horizontal line over the entire route of the aqueduct. Over 40 feet along this line, the vertical distance between it and the ground was recorded. When the line was drawn on parchment, the vertical distances were marked below it. By connecting all the marks with a single line, the map makers obtained an accurate profile of the land. By then drawing the line of the aqueduct on the plan, the engineers could easily see whether it would sit on the ground, cut through the ground, or rise above the ground. The aqueduct had to be built with a constant slope from the beginning to the end to keep the water moving. To prevent people from stealing or poisoning the water, most of the aqueduct was raised about 50 feet off the ground. It was supported by a continuous row of arches built on tall square piers which rested on deep foundations. Page 39. Diagram of Aqueduct. Page 41. The foundations and piers were constructed of stone-faced concrete. Stone set in mortar on the outside with layers of concrete on the inside. To make the concrete, the masons first laid a course of rough stones across the area to be filled. The mortar men then covered the stones with a layer of mortar to bind them together. When the mortar had set, the process was repeated. When two piers were finished, an arch was constructed between them. The aqueduct, itself a rectangular stone pipe about four feet wide and six feet high, was then built on top. The inner surface of the pipe was lined with hard cement to prevent leaks. The route chosen for the aqueduct required that a short tunnel be dug through a hill. Every 20 yards, vertical shafts were sunk from the surface of the hill to the level of the proposed aqueduct. The depths of the shafts were measured from a profile plan. The laborers connected the ends of the shafts, and as a section was completed, the masons lined it with stone and cement. Appius Fluvius, the chief water engineer, rode out from the city once a week to inspect construction. The foremen and laborers lived in campsites which moved with, with the aqueduct farther and farther from the city. For 20 miles, the aqueduct ran alongside the main highway, and the laborers would often stop to watch the endless procession of merchants and farmers. About three years after construction began, large numbers of families could be seen traveling towards the city. Many belonged to the soldiers stationed in Verbonia. During the fifth year of construction, the aqueduct turned away from the highway, and two years later it was completed. Page 43 is the end of this section. To continue reading, start the next MP3.